Hey everyone, I'm, I'm Brian Cantrell. I'm the, the CTO of the Oxide Computer Company. Um, I'm a little worried because uh, John Masters, who is a friend of mine, um, formerly of Red Hat, now at Nuvia, uh, tweeted out a reference to this talk and he, he only included the title um, kind of up until the colon. Um, Brian's gonna talk on the soul of a new machine. Um, and I would say a decent amount of the internet believed that I am leading a book club discussion of uh, Tracy Kidder's superlative The Soul of a New Machine. Um, I'm not, so it, 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 I'm happy to talk about The Soul of a New Machine. I love it, it's an amazing book. If you haven't read it, uh, it is truly, it is, it is uh, the, the Iliad uh, or the Odyssey. It is the literature of our domain, but I'm only using it as a title, um, so no disrespect to Kidder. Um, but um, wh what I really want to speak of is really kind of tap into some of that, that same fervor and passion and depth that, that Kidder described. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Solve a New Machine describes the development of the, the data general Eclipse, codenamed Eagle, um, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and it was, it was kind of, a, it was a time when, uh, and you know, people have asked me if I romanticize, you know, the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Um, and maybe a little bit, you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a tiny bit. Um, I, I don't think I overly romanticize them. Um, but this is, I would call the, the, the first real server. Um, because this is the first machine that is really powerful enough. And um, y y the 709 is, uh, is an amazing machine. It is, uh, it is the first machine that is, is really um, powerful enough to actually have a, a time-shared workload on it. Um, and this is the, this is the last of the, um, of, of the vacuum, tube, vacuum tube machines. Um, obviously, the machine. I, this is a, the control panel from the 709. This is not the actual 709 itself. Um, the, the, the actual 709 itself is uh, quite a bit larger than this, um, quite a bit less beautiful. This is actually from the. Uh, the there was a, a terrific series of surveys done um, in the the kind of the dawn of computing of effectively all computers in the U.S. Um, and this is probably the, this is the last year it could have been reasonably done. Um, but this is the um, the 709 that was at Hughes. There were a bunch of 709s. I, I just I call this one out um, because the the. Uh, the, the dimensions are um, something else uh, for a computer. And this is one of the things that, that it, it's easy to forget in kind of the post-transistorized age. Vacuum tubes have a lot of draws. Turns out the transistor's a really good idea. Um, vacuum tubes are pretty power intensive. Um, 205 kW for the IBM 709, which is, so to, as, as a reminder, like a rack draws somewhere between, if, between 10 and 25 kW for a rack today. That is 205 kilowatts in 1961. For a machine that is 33,000 pounds, it is 1,900 square feet. I love the fact that the machine is 2,000 square feet, and the air conditioner is another 1,000 square feet. Um, so this is a fire-breathing monster, although it wasn't really a monster. I mean, it, really, it was really tepid from a sizing perspective. But it was the first machine that was big enough, and the reason it's important is because it is the first server, um, and it, in that, it is the first machine that is large enough to actually run t a time-shared workload. Um, and indeed, the compatible time-sharing system, CTSS, was originally done on, demonstrated on the IBM 709 uh, in the early 60. So the server-side computing is born. What do I mean by server-side computing? I mean a computer that you don't necessarily hold in your hands, you don't have in front of you, um, you don't necessarily see or hear or smell. It is running your workload at some kind of a distance. Um, you know, fast forward through the, through, through the 70s, um, you, you know, um, if, if you are of a certain vintage, um, this is certainly mother's milk to you. This, this is the, the, the PDP 1170. Um, this is the, um, if the, the 709 was the, the kind of the dawn of the mainframes, and I've, I've kind of cut, a, I've cut out the 360. I would happily talk about historical machines the entire time. I've cut out the 360, obviously a very important machine. Um, but the PDP 1170 is certainly an interesting machine in many different dimensions. Um, this is now a scaled down machine and one where you can run workloads um, much more locally than you could with, with a mainframe. Uh, very, very important machine. Uh, actually, one of my co-founders has got a replica of this machine in her, in her house, which is pretty great, running a Raspberry Pi, blinking the lights, which is pretty neat. Um, but, uh, and, and with the, the kind of the mini computer um, revolution in, in the 70s, um, these machines were getting smaller, yes. 
That is a good question. That's a one. That's a good one to raise with her. I actually don't know. I do know from having messed around with the JavaScript emulator of the PDP eleven seventy that there are a lot to choose from. So uh, the, the um, you should be running. You should be running tops ten, tops twenty. I think ran on the PDP eleven seventy. Um, no, 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 it didn't. It, all right, ran. Let's see the sign. Um, she uh, certainly Unix ran on the PDP 1170. I'm, I don't think she's running a full blown Unix kernel. Anyway, um, important system ran a bunch of different operating systems. Obviously, um, the um, and a, a, a seminal machine, a machine that definitely um, outperformed from a deck perspective for sure. They expected to make ten thousand of these, and they made a hundred thousand plus. We made the company. Um, th then we get to so th you know th this may be mother's milk for many of you in the room, um, many people online. Um, this is mother's milk for me. So um, I, I, I worked for Sun for 14 years. Um, this is the, the, the Sun E10K. I love the fact that this, is, this photo is even taken from a vantage point to make this machine look as imposing as possible. Um, this is a machine with 64 CPUs, uh, 64 gigabytes of memory. And this is a machine that, especially 1999, um, you know, I, I, I feel like as a survivor of the dot-com bust, I feel it's my responsibility to younger generations to explain that you actually are not in a recession-proof industry. Um, this box in particular um, ran a good chunk of the internet. A lot of, a lot of websites ran on this, sometimes infamously. Um, eBay uh, started off on a two-processor machine, ended up with one of these 64-processor giants, um, and and because they didn't revisit their architecture along the way, um, hadn't bothered to make, uh, or they couldn't take the machine down, excuse me, um, for any kind of maintenance at all. Um, so, of course, they were, uh, they were operating under a death warrant that was signed that they didn't quite realize. Um, and eBay very famously went down uh, in 1997 running one of these machines um, in a, in a disaster of absolutely biblical proportions, down for 22 hours. Um, but it, it was it was eye opening in a lot of ways. Uh, it was eye opening because of how important server side computing had become. That we were now actually running commerce on a single machine, running commerce with the these the server side computers that we uh, had actually not really designed with uptime in mind. Suddenly became very load bearing um, with respect to this new economy, and, and it was a very very eye opening. But so what, what happened from 1999 and from the kind of the, you had a, uh, a couple of very, uh, computer companies, excuse me, computer companies making very large machines. And what, uh, what happened is the microprocessor, and this was the Spark microprocessor, which, um, you, you know, uh, sadly the, the children today have not necessarily heard of because, uh, Spark, um, and every other risk microprocessor, uh, effectively lost the plot to, to Intel x86. Um, and what happened was that the, the, the microprocessor in here, and in power machines and in NPA risk based machines and in alpha machines could no longer compete with the economics of the x86. And, uh, what people began to realize is like, actually, I can get, you know, this is a 64 processor machine, but I can have a workload that runs maybe, maybe with a, a quarter of the number of CPUs, maybe, a, maybe a tenth. But I can do that for a 20th of the cost or one one hundredth of the cost. Um, and that effectively, um, that revolution, the microprocessor revolution, uh, extinguished these large servers. Um, and we ended up with this. Um, we went from, from this in 1999 is the state of the art in, in server side computing. I think I'm going to need some water, by the way. By the, um, to my apologies, it's much drier down here than it is in, in San Francisco. Um, the, to um, to this in in 2009, and uh, this is sad in a lot of ways. Um, so, um, and I, I don't mean to pick on it. This is an important machine. This is the HP DL380. I think this is a Gen 5 DL380. The DL380 became uh, a, a ubiquitous machine, again, x86 at its core. But the reason this is sad is because this is a, this, this is a server, thank you. Uh, this is a server, um, but you notice there's a, there's a CD tray in front. It's like, what is a, what is a CD tray? I mean, we're going to be playing music in the data center. Why do we have a, why do we have a CD tray in here? Um, and what is the display port? That's a VGA port sitting over there. Uh, what is that thing for? And the answer is that this is actually, despite it being rack mounted, th this is a personal computer. This is architecturally a personal computer. Architecturally, 
This is the machine we talk about. We talk about the PDP 1170 as, as outperforming expectations. The IBM PC really outperformed expectations, right? Uh, and the IBM PC was really designed to be, you know, IBM's entree into what seemed to be a very hobbyist market. They thought they were going to sell 10,000 of them, obviously sold millions and millions of them. And the architectural decisions that were made in Boca Raton in 1979 are still being seen in this machine in 2009. So you've got a whole bunch of parts that are no longer being made in 2009. You've got the, the, the IBM, the, the Intel 8254, the 8057, 8059 are all these, these little parts that are now being emulated effectively in this server in 2009. And the, it's, it's just, and it, the only reason we have that is because it was the microprocessor that won. It's because the x86 conquered every other microprocessor. It dragged along this kind of regrettable architecture with it. And now at the same time, um, there were a bunch of folks whose computing needs were really growing very, very substantial. Um, and they were beginning to, as they were looking down uh, these machines, they were unimpressed. And these are folks like Google. We talk, talked about Google in the intro. By 2009, Google has got very substantial compute needs. And it's dawning on Google that they actually don't want to run personal computers in their data center. They want to run a more purpose fit machine. And this is kind of their, their first attempt at this. Um, this is kind of an infamous attempt at their first machine um, in that you can see they've got Velcro. So there are those disks and the power supply are all secured with Velcro. Um, the, you can see that the, the, there's a 12 volt battery there, uh, in, in, uh, lieu of a UPS. They actually just had a 12 volt battery attached to every server. Um, this gigabyte motherboard is, uh, is the kind of thing you'd sweep off a floor. I mean, no offense to gigabyte. Um, but th they've gone with uh, absolutely, they have saved, uh, they've shaved everything down to the pennies here to try to have the cheapest possible machine. Um, which seems like a reasonable thing to do. Like we're buying a gazillion of these. We should make these as cheap as possible. Um, and Google learned a lesson that has been learned for time immemorial in computing. Um, that is that um, you, you, uh, you always want to seek value, but you have to be careful about uh, um, unwittingly really getting what you paid for. And when you have components that are um, that are DRAM components that have been refurbed, for example, that have um, that have uh, 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 errors in them or that are non-ECC, I mean non-ECC DRAM, um, the the kinds of failures that you have up the stack uh, aren't worth the pennies that you saved. Um, but they were onto something. They, Google and Facebook and others, were onto something in that they were getting rid of a bunch of things that they didn't need. So, you know, what, on, what you don't see on this is you don't see the CD drive. You don't see the VGA port. Uh, you don't see some of, uh, of these kind of these personal computer uh, ephemera and, and accoutrements um, are being stripped down to have a really a purpose-built machine. Um, and as time went on, uh, so this is the hyperscale computing circa 2009. This is kind of hyperscale computing, I would say circa 2020. Uh, this is more like uh, 2016, 2017. So th uh, this is a Facebook's Tioga Pass design. Um, so this is a compute sled. Uh, this is a compute sled that goes right into a bus bar. So there is no, um, you know, here we had a, uh, a, a power supply uh, the power supply is gone here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the power supply is gone here. There's no power supply. This is plugging straight into a bus bar, a DC bus bar. There's a power shelf in the middle of the rack that's doing all of the conversion. And when you are at any kind of modest scale, this is a much more sensible design. It, it makes much more sense to have a DC bus bar. And everybody was kind of coming to the same conclusion. Everybody, uh, hyperscalers were all kind of coming to the same conclusion that people have come to for a, uh, for a long time, which is that power conversion is really inefficient. And the more times you do power conversion, the more you lose. And as you begin to optimize around PUE and driving that PUE down, it is to try to be as efficient as possible to have all of your power go to your computing and none of it going to heating the room um, or as little as possible to heating the room, um, you are naturally go to these designs. So there, there are a couple, of, so there, there's 
bus, uh, there's a bus bar design that's interesting. The, um, the, the networking cables are actually in the front for, for accessibility. This slides into a, a wider chassis. So this has got three across instead of two across. Um, it is not the 19 inch rack. The 19 inch rack is, is a very historical kind of a number. Um, and this is going into a rack that is a, that fits in a floor tile, fits in a 24 inch flo floor tile, but is a wider rack. It's a taller rack. Um, it's got that, that power shelf in it. And it's designed to be a, this is part of a rack that has true rack level design. Facebook designed their own switch wedge that goes with this. Um, they've, they've designed their own storage chassis, Bryce Canyon that goes with this and all made uh, the designs all made available in the open. So this is, this is the evolution of computing. It's kind of good to see, like we're back on track. So computing is back on track. We've got these modern designs. Okay. We can all, uh, breathe easy. Well, not so fast because, uh, this is in hyperscale computing and this is great. And this, again, this box is a really nice box. Um, meanwhile, uh, this was server side computing circa 2009. And here the grand reveal server side computing circa 2020. Uh, again, not to pick on HP, but sorry, HP. Um, so we have gone from, let's see, we've gone from a CD drive to a DVD drive. So literally you can, I mean, when you buy these machines today, they have a DVD drive. Um, they've got, um, we've gone from, uh, VGA to HDMI. I mean, these are not improvements. These are improvements for a personal computer or for a machine that is designed to run Windows, not a, des a machine that should be designed to run in a data center. This is still a rack mounted personal computer. And it is that much more galling that the world that is operating at any kind of scale has to actually look at this almost. I mean, it's, I, I, it's, I'm so glad that Facebook and Google and so on have been so upfront about their designs, but, but it sharpens the pain for those of us who don't have the infrastructure privilege of these folks to know that like, actually there's great innovations. We just can't have them. Um, and that's, that's very frustrating. It's very frustrating to me personally. So, so my personal history, um, I was at Sun Microsystems for 14 years. Um, and then Sun was invaded, sadly. Um, I left after the invasion. Um, the, um, I, I went to a cloud computing company and I was there for, um, for 10 years. I uh, was bought by Samsung and we were building out a very large private cloud effectively. Um, and we were doing it on more or less these kinds of machines. Um, and it, it's not just that these were aesthetically displeasing, it's that there were real consequences up and down the stack for running what is effectively a, a personal computer. So th this brings us to kind of the, the problem that we have today. Um, there are, and I mean, this is the, the our very contrarian thinking. Uh, the, I actually don't believe that Jeff Bezos is gonna own and operate every computer on the planet. Very renegade belief. Um, I believe that there are reasons to own and operate your own computer. Um, they are often economic reasons. I mean, there are a lot of reasons. There can be risk management reasons, um, but they often boil down to economics. Uh, that when you are running a certain amount of compute, it makes more sense to own it rather than rent it. Uh, and we, we've seen this at, uh, uh, from a bunch of different companies at a bunch of different scales, um, not least at my former employer. So w we know that these economic reasons exist, but we've got the, this bifurcated world. And the bifurcated world is actually even, even worse than it looks like because part of the reason in that, when we look at that, that HP commercial server, when we look at this thing, part of what it is trying to do is present to honestly windows a personal computer upon which to run so the Part of, uh, it's not like the engineers of these companies uh, believe that this is the right architecture. It's just that they are confined to their layer of the stack, which is the hardware, the machine. They don't own the actual software substrate that sits on top of it. And uh, they, they don't really have the ability to control that software substrate. That's, that's another company, usually not just another organization. And meanwhile, the people that do control that software substrate don't have necessarily any understanding or desire to control the hardware substrate. So you end up with this, this divide, this standoff that has endured now for a decade plus where you, you have the, these, these two effectively technology uh, pools are entirely isolated from one another and they operate at cross purposes. I mean, if you are tasked with right now, if you are tasked, given a budget and told to run an elastic compute 
infrastructure platform on your own premises, you are stuck cobbling things together. You are stuck, and, and the, the state of the art is really no better than it was 10 years ago. Um, you are stuck with personal computer companies. You are stuck, the open source software that's out there is not really designed to run clouds at any kind of scale. Um, so you are gonna be designing it, you're gonna be integrating it, you're gonna be operating it, and most importantly, you are going to be supporting it. Um, and it's extremely frustrating. You can have arbitrary sophistication and still be very frustrated by this. Certainly that was the case for us. Um, we, had, we had many, 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 many problems, um, one of which was a pandemic of DIM failures. And we were seeing pan a pandemic of uncorrectable DIM failures. And the thing that was very frustrating to us is that we would see no correctables before seeing that uncorrectable, the uncorrectable that would ultimately panic the box. And if you've been around memory for any length of time, you know that that's not really the way the world works, that you don't, in ECC memory, you don't see an uncorrectable generally out of clear blue sky. You generally see a rising number of correctable errors, and those correctable errors indicate you've got a problem here. We're losing data here. And this can be due to design defects. This can be due to poor DIM training. This can be due, oh, there's all sorts of things that can cause this kind of loss of data. But those correctables indicate that that's happening. Well, the problem is that the firmware was eating all those correctables. So we, in, in the software that we controlled, we had no ability to forecast that this was coming. And by the way, if we knew known it was coming, we could have taken action on this. And if we could have known that, hey, this machine, by the way, is, has seen a spike in correctable errors, there are things that we can go do to force that, to force those DIMS to retrain or what have you. But without that kind of insight and trying to get firmware, that would actually properly elevate these errors into system software was like trying to get a bill through Congress. It just felt like, you know, you go to, again, you go to a personal computer company and ask for a custom firmware build, and they're like, why would anyone running a personal computer want their own firmware? That doesn't make any sense. Like, well, I'm not running a personal computer. I'm running a cloud. Um, but it, it, th that disconnect um, was felt very acutely by us, certainly, and it's been acutely felt by many, many, many people. This is not... Uh, this is not novel or not unique to us. So we feel you really need a, a fundamentally new approach. Um, and um, so we, we think you need to take a, a, a pretty clean sheet of paper here. Um, and so if you're going to go design a computer in 2020 from scratch-ish, uh, what would you want? Um, first, let's not actually redesign the microprocessor. So uh, the, the, the microprocessor, uh, be it Intel or AMD or, or even ARM, um, th th those are very sophisticated devices and they themselves are not, uh, are, are fit for enterprise purpose. So uh, Intel and AMD and ARM and so on are, are fit for the purpose. We, we want one of those folks. Um, that said, there are a bunch of other things we want to go revisit. In particular, one of the things we want is real firmware attestation. Um, so it, when you run, you know, when you run one of these guys, um, you've got no knowledge of the firmware that's actually running on that machine. And if you have an issue where you're required to take a firmware upgrade, a firmware update, you get a BIOS upgrade or what have you, you've got no idea what's in that. Um, what you do have, if you do a kind of a modicum of analysis on the binary, uh, you will begin to lose sleep at night very quickly because you will see things like URLs. Like, what is a URL doing in my BIOS? This is the brainstem of my data center. Why is there a URL in here? Uh, try to get an answer to that question. I, and not that it's like an uncomfortable question. It's you literally can't find anyone who can answer it. It's not that they don't want to answer it necessarily, although that too. Um, what is a URL doing? And presumably not because your vendor has been infiltrated by Kim Jong-un, presumably, but you don't actually know that. And you've got no way of knowing that. You've got no way of knowing that what you're running is attested. You've got third parties in there. I mean, even when you have companies that wish to actually provide the source code to their firmware, their firmware isn't even theirs. This is one of these things that's just stunning to me. And I, I mean no offense to them, but how is AMI still running at the brainstem of humanity? Um, the American Mega Trend, Trends Incorporated, this is a company that was around when I was a kid. I'm old. Um, it, it has, it, I mean, again, it's got a right to exist, but why does an AMI bias exist 
on industrial grade machines. It makes no sense. So you got these third parties that, that aren't going to make available their source code. You can't actually see into it. Um, and you can't actually know what you're running. And this becomes really, really, really relevant. If you saw the, uh, the Bloomberg story, um, in, uh, 2018, the fall of 2018, about the supermicro infiltration, right? Supply chain infiltration in supermicro. Um, the, and it described a very sophisticated attack that the reporter stood by, and there, you can speculate about what actually happened there. Um, almost certainly the story as written was not true, even though I think the reporter believes it's true, um, and that, that uh, Supermicro supply chain was not actually infiltrated, uh, and there was not a device, we don't believe. Uh, no one has produced it, put it that way. But you may have had the same reaction that I certainly had upon reading that story, which is out of curiosity, why would anyone mount this very sophisticated attack, frankly, when you can just walk in through the firmware? Most super micro BMCs have the default root password on them. Um, many of them are on the internet. They are, many of them are vulnerable to known vulnerabilities. I mean, if you really want to get terrified, there's a vulnerability called USB Anywhere um, that found by Rick Alther, who described it at the Open Source Firmware Conference last year. And as part of this, Rick was looking for BMCs that were on the internet. He found 77,000 BMCs that were on the internet that he, that could have been owned. Um, and Rick is an extremely responsible person, so he made sure to get it all communicated and so on. But that is actually terrifying. And the BMC, by the way, is the, the, the baseboard management controller. This is the computer within the computer. Well, this is one of the computers within the computer. There are several computers within the computer, as it turns out. Um, and this is one of the computers within the computer. This is the one that is the most troubling in, in some regards because it's a full functioning machine in there. It's, it's running U-Boot, running Linux. Um, and running proprietary software that you can't see from either A-Speed or Nuviton, and that thing is on the brainstem. That, that is a bus master that is sitting in your computer. Um, and by the way, you hang it out on the, on the network because that's what your vendor tells you to do. So this BMC is talking to both your PCI bus, the PCI bus master, and it's talking to the network. Um, and you've got no idea what's in that software. That's disturbing and troubling. Um, we need to get the, we, we've got to revisit all this. We need an actual proper hardware root of trust that can actually attest firmware. And this, this kind of BMC outgrowth, um, needs to be completely rethought and slashed. And we need to go back to a service processor. The, what this thing needs to do is it needs to be able to bounce the box. It needs to be able to give you a serial line. And that's about it. There, are, there may be like, you can count it on one hand, the other things you need. You, yes, you need to have some fan control and things in there. What it does not need to do is provide virtual VGA or virtual USB. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily need a networking stack, kind of depending on how you plumb it up. But we need to get back to a service processor and away from the, this, this kind of horrifically complicated BMC. Um, we also need host firmware whose mission in life should be to hand the CPU off to the host operating system. You, host firmware, what your job is, is is to bring the host operating system its cup of coffee and shoot yourself in the head. That should be the role of host firmware. That's a little graphic, I apologize. The, uh, the, that is the role of host firmware. This idea that firmware should execute and then somehow stay resident so it can be called into at arbitrary times to do arbitrary things is, it's, it's, it, this is DOS. That's, that's the DOS mentality and approach. And DOS robbed me of my childhood, okay? I've got a chip on my shoulder about DOS because I grew up without memory protection at a time after memory protection existed. And I just thought computers just kind of reset randomly. Um, they don't and shouldn't. Um, and as soon as I found out about memory prote protection when I arrived in college, I'm like, wait a minute, why didn't I have Unix growing up? I, I grew up in the 80s, Unix was around. Um, and of course, there are complicated answers to that question. Um, but I, I, we, we should not have a DOS mentality. We should not be relying on this kind of unseen firmware that is load-bearing and, and, and needs to do work. So there's a lot to be done on the firmware side. And you when know, we talk about the, the, uh, the, the um, BMC is the computer within the computer, there are actually several computers within the computer. There's one that's even in some ways more disturbing some ways slightly less because it, uh, it's something called the Intel Management Engine um, or the Platform Security Processor on AMD, the PSP. Um, the Management Engine is an entire operating system that exists um, on, the, on the, another computer that exists effectively on the motherboard. Um, and that thing also has total control over heaven and earth. It runs Minix. Um, and yes, there have been vulnerabilities in it. So um, a Management Engine is still completely proprietary. Uh, the PSP uh, is, is AMD's equivalent of this. It actually at least lives on die. Makes 
feel slightly less worried about it um, as opposed to the PCH. But um, we, we need to, to get visibility into it is a reasonable thing to be able to understand every instruction that's executing on your computer. That is a reasonable request. We are not there yet. We're actually a long way from that, but, but we think that that's, that's needed for, for a new computer. Um, we also need a true rack scale design. So um, there have been a couple in the industry that have attempted, by, by rack scale design, I mean really thinking about the entire rack. Taking a bunch of two U's and slapping it into a rack is not a rack scale design. That, that is, that's just rack and stacked. But this is where we are actually integrating the top of rack switch with, so integrating our networking with storage, with compute, and actually building these things together so they are aware of one another. We are actually co-designing them. You cannot do this without software. Um, and a, a bunch of companies, I don't want to pick on them, but you know, Intel has had a, had a lot of rack scale design work for a long time, but they never wanted to have a software component because software was someone else's job. The problem is that if you don't have that software component, you cannot deliver a true rack scale design. So we, we, we need to take a, a real rack scale approach where we're designing these things together. You can't just, and this is where, you know, interoperability is great in principle, but it is very corrosive when you want to make an actual tight integrated design. And we need to not be interoperable with arbitrary top of rack switches. You need to pull that top of rack switch in and then push that boundary of interoperability out to the network. And clearly you need to be able to talk to other switches and so on in the network. Um, but we want rack scale design. Um, we also want to have a dense form factor. So um, we actually deserve the kind of density that we see out of the hyperscalers. This is a real challenge because the, um, the hyperscalers really do design their data centers basically from scratch. Um, and they do a bunch of things at the DC level that are very hard for someone else to emulate. So um, if you, and you can be a, have a lot of compute, um, but it, it's very hard to get to kind of their level of scale where you're locating DCs next to dams and so on. Um, so this is a challenge because we're in the enterprise, in the mainstream enterprise, you're not gonna drop in 25 kW into a rack. I mean, I'd love to, it'd be great, but that's not practical um, because that, it, that it's just, it's, it's too much draw, uh, too much to cool. Um, so you definitely can't run, the, the plans of running an IBM 709 are probably been trashed. Um, but we, we need to, that said, within the KW budget we have for a rack, um, which on the order of 10 to 15 KW, we need to get maximal density um, and need to look at things like a bus bar based design. Why, why can I not buy a machine if I'm, you know, General Electric, or I'm, if I am, you know, if I'm Barclays, if I am General Motors, I can't buy a bus bar based machine, no matter how much compute I'm operating. That seems to be a little bit ridiculous because it seems to me that we should be having an eye towards really efficient operation, which is not necessarily low power operation, by the way. This is a high power operation, um, but, but really targeting efficiency. So there's a lot to be done from, from the hardware and firmware perspective. Um, and then there, there's a lot to be done from the software perspective. And in the, this is really, you know, I think in terms of the, 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 the beliefs that we and I have, this is probably the one that is, is the, the, the deepest in our marrow. Uh, and this is where you just, you, you're just not going to get the Sun Microsystems out of me. Um, I just believe strongly that a, a computer should have hardware and software that have been co-designed. Um, that when you design things together, you yield a better artifact um, because you are actually able to control elements of the design and you're able to yield a higher performing artifact. Um, but in, in terms of what does that software mean? What, uh, what, you know, where do you kind of stop the scope of that? I think in terms of in 2020, the boundary for the computer is at the API endpoint to provision a virtual machine. You have to view the, the you know, if the, if the, the boundary uh, in the 70s and 80s was kind of that, that multi-user shell, um, it w was kind of the, the, the boundary. Uh, then the boundary now is much higher up in the stack where I can hit an API endpoint provision and provision a VM. There's a whole lot of software be between those API endpoints and the actual provision. There's a hypervisor, there are, uh, there's a top rack switch, there, there is a, a compute st uh, control plane, there's a storage control plane, um, and then you're going to have API endpoints for both operator and developer. So a lot of software to be done in the modern computer, but I think this is what, this is what's required because right now that software is being cobbled together by the end user, um, and that, that seems um, unfair and unjust to me. Now that said, okay, that's a lot of software, so are we gonna like weld the software 
onto the machine, it's like, well, yes and no, um, because certainly the era of proprietary infrastructure software is well and truly over. So we, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to do bluntly what Apple does. I, I love the iPhone, but the the inaccessibility, and I love the iPhone from a user experience perspective, but the inaccessibility um, from the, the perspective of actually understanding the system and being able to modify it actually is a problem. Um, so um, the, the software really needs to be fully open and completely attached. So you want to build on, on the, the, this tradition of open source software. Fortunately, a lot of what needs to be done here is software. There, that much of, if you, if you look at, you begin to envision that rack scale machine, um, a lot of what needs to be developed is software. Yes, there is hardware, but a lot of the hardware and the hardware innovations are actually out there. Fortunately, uh, Facebook... Um, and actually we'll talk about it in, the, in the next slide in terms of how things are changing. The things are changing such that this is actually an easier problem. So um, is this attainable at all? Can we do this? Um, and there have been plenty in the industry, by the way, who have accepted the status quo um, and have just said, you know what? This is just not going to change. Um, hopefully this will get better, but it's not going to change. And honestly... Um, I, I counted myself among that number. I was very, very frustrated by the, this kind of bifurcated state, but I was just kind of hoping it would get better. Um, and when I, I kind of went back and deployed a bunch of new compute, being like, oh, please let it have gotten, and of course it's not gotten better because it's so, it's structurally so problematic. So um, we, it, we, we have to be able to do this. We have to solve this problem because um, one, this is not science, right? This is engineering. We actually know how to solve all these problems. Um, it's just that we've got this kind of this, this organizational standoff that is preventing them from being solved. But there are reasons to think that this is attainable. First of all, this can be tightly tailored. So you don't need to run, importantly, running a computer, developing a computer that can run an arbitrary operating system from DOS 6.2.2 or whatever to, to a, a modern operating system is a very constrained problem. Um, and if you're going to run every operating system under the sun, or you're going to run every hypervisor and support that, um, that becomes difficult. When you can tightly tailor things, um, the opportunities open up. And this is, what, by the way, what the hyperscalers do. The hyperscalers do not run arbitrary operating systems on their bare metal. They run their hypervisors on their bare metal. Um, so we can tightly tailor things. Um, and by, by designing one with the other, um, you can eliminate false generalities in both software and in the hardware. So you don't need to, in the software, you don't need to support every device under the sun. You can support the devices that, that you've actually selected. So the, the, you can make it a smaller engineering problem by being, by being careful. But importantly, there are also some larger trends that actually make this easier than it has been historically. Because historically, I think this is, this would be actually very difficult. Um, so a couple of big trends. Uh, first is on the, on the hardware side, um, lots of folks, folks have recognized the need for a hardware root of trust. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, I, I think we have, and, uh, and for this, and I think actually that the, the final point on this slide, uh, I think we actually have my Annus Horribilis of 2018 to thank in Spectre and Meltdown. So um, Spectre and Meltdown were the vulnerabilities in, in Intel's CPUs. Um, I discovered those um, on January 1st, 2018 with most of the world in a hacker news thread where someone was speculating about some kind of fishy patches they saw to Linux and wondering if there had actually, if, if there was a, a vulnerability here. And of course, we had not been a part of any embargo. I hadn't heard anything. We're a huge Intel customer at the time. Um, I'm thinking like, I hope this is not the case. Um, but over the next couple of days, of course, we learned that we were vulnerable um, to not just Spectre, but, but Meltdown. And Meltdown, um, so for those of you who are, are I mean, presumably have heard of Spectre and Meltdown, um, Meltdown in particular is really, really bad. Um, all of these things are effectively, ironically, using the, the speculative execution of the microprocessor to get access to information you're not supposed to have. Um, and it's ironic because it was that speculative execution that actually allowed x86 to get past the memory wall and uh, best effectively every other microprocessor out there. In fact, I was talking, I think it was even John Masters who was saying that like, hey, do you think Spark would have any of these issues? I'm like, no, Spark would not have any of these issues because Spark's problem was not speculative enough. I, Spark wasn't smart enough to have these issues, bluntly. I mean, smart's too pejorative. But um, the, Spark didn't speculate enough. So the, the, the presence of these vulnerabilities deep, 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 deep in the stack highlighted 
all of these problems up the stack. And suddenly all of these firmware issues that had been people knew were out there, suddenly you had sent this, this beacon to security researchers that this is a target rich environment. You can become famous by like gangster famous, which is what all the kind of security researchers, as far as I can tell, want to become by finding these vulnerabilities. Um, and um, some very, very clever people poured over some very ill-conceived software that was not designed to have that kind of, uh, 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 of uh, examination. We found vulnerabilities everywhere, and people are now very concerned about hard, uh, the hardware root of trust and firmware attestation. This is great. So um, we've seen this at Microsoft Cerberus is an effort that they're, they're, they are opening up, um, but more, more recently in uh, Google's Open Titan. So uh, Titan is, um, in fact, in many ways, the, the best computer that people don't, I think, properly acknowledge is the Chromebook. Um, the Chromebook is actually a really, really impressive machine in a lot of ways. The Chromebook actually solved a lot of these problems, albeit for the personal computer. So it was firmware that was attested, did have a hardware root trust on it, that's Titan, um, and, uh, and allows you to actually, you can load your own firmware on it. In that regard, it's in contrast to the iPhone. But when you load your own firmware on it, then the Chromebook itself knows I am running foreign firmware. Um, and it knows that... The, to, to not attach to something, um, it knows that it can't trust the software substrate that it's on. Um, so they, they did this with Titan and, and the microprocessors that, that it, Titan is kind of a family of ASICs at Google. Open Titan is Google's effort to actually generate an industry-wide effort. Now, Open Titan, um, like many things that Google does, Google did not open up Titan. They are generating a new effort that is in the open. So this is kind of like Kubernetes versus Borg, if you will. Um, but that's great. That's a great effort. Certainly laud that. Um, and tacking into those efforts... Um, collaborating with them and so on makes it easier. We're not by ourselves trying to solve this problem. So that, that's a really interesting development. Another big development that I don't think gets nearly enough attention is the open EDA movement. Um, so the, the, the grand irony is, uh, you know, people, um, it was easier to get a hardware company funded two decades ago, but hardware has never been easier than it is today. Um, it is the, the uh, developing and, and you know, a, historically the EDA space has been one of the last bastions of proprietary software. Uh, and now you're seeing all sorts of interesting things out there. Um, Yosis, Chisel, uh, Spinal HDL, these are HDLs, uh, Yosis verification. Uh, and then uh, something, I mean, this is a very emerging area, something called BlueSpec, which was actually developed uh, 15 plus years ago at MIT, um, was historically a proprietary, I would call it a, a VHDL. It, 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 to call it an HDL does it a disservice because BlueSpec is actually taking things up a, a, a level in terms of the abstraction in which you, you define the, um, the FPGA. Um, BlueSpec is really interesting. And this is just open source like 10 days ago, uh, two weeks ago, something like that, very recently. Um, really, really interesting development. Um, and we are th 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 very uh, engaged, I would say, um, in BlueSpec. Um, so uh, th a lot of interesting things on the FPGA side, making it easier and easier and easier to do one's own FPGA, which of course allows you to do all sorts of interesting things. Um, another terrific development is the development of RISC-V. Um, so RISC-V um, is a, a, a new instruction set architecture um, by Dave Patterson and co. Um, if, if you haven't, I really recommend reading the, the, the RISC-V atlas, I believe they call it, um, where they go through the instruction set. It is a delightful read because they are so deliberate about learning from everything in the history of instruction set design. So trying to do, uh, really trying to learn what was done right and what was not done right. Um, and in the history of instruction sets, there are a lot of like, there are a lot of ideas. Um, some good, some less so. Um, but we should be able to benefit from that. Um, and uh, RISC-V is, is really interesting because not only has it learned from all those things and tried to not recreate you know, and I, I, for every ISA, they have really done a very good job of looking at what they did right and what they did wrong and trying to develop best of breed. Um, but at the same time, this is all freely available. There's no licensing involved in this whatsoever. So this allows you to have now these soft cores. So you can have a, a license free soft core as part of an FPGA really easily. I mean, this is not hard at all. And you can now have your own software 
running on that Risk Five core. Now, is that software running with megabytes and megabytes of memory? No, it's running in a pretty constrained environment, but it allows you to actually have computational programmability at very, very, very low levels of the stack in the FPGA. So that's, that's really neat um, and a really important development. Um, and then another thing that's happening, and again, I, and personally, my read is, this is a consequence of Spectre Meltdown, is that open firmware is finally arriving. So there was a time when I, it, it felt like open firmware was never going to happen. Um, that is to say, we would have a closed legacy bias forever. Um, but with Spectre Meltdown and with the new focus on these vulnerabilities deep in the stack, and thanks to the hyperscalers who really uh, demand this and are funding it accordingly and are working with their microprocessor vendors to demand open firmware and at the same time funding efforts themselves, we are now seeing the arrival of open firmware. Um, in fact, the, the best conference I attended, I think, in the last year is the Open Source Firmware Conference, um, which was uh, just over here at Google and Facebook, um, which was terrific. It reminded me of a conference back in the day um, where you would, you know, back before the internet, you, as I tell the children, uh, when you, you would go to these conferences thinking that you were the only person in the world interested in what was a very kind of narrow slice of humanity, and you'd walk in and there'd be like 300 kindred spirits, um, and it felt very empowering, and that's what open firmware feels like. It's a uh, really terrific community and a lot of fun. And all that is being encouraged by this thing, the Open Compute Project. So OCP is interesting, uh, developed by Facebook, the Tioga Pass is an OCP design that I showed you. Um, the uh, originally spearheaded by Facebook with the actual, with a very explicit idea of uh, passing these innovations on to other folks that were not that are not competitors with Facebook. So Facebook viewed it as honestly a social responsibility, which feels a little strange now because Facebook is said, if Facebook, I mean, it's like the company that subverted democracy felt social responsibility, like, okay, when did that disappear? Um, but the but talking to the folks that led that effort in inside of Facebook, 2010, 2011 very earnestly heartfelt effort to pass on especially some of these efficiency gains around things like bus bar based designs and so on. So um, that has been, uh, um, th that oh, the Open Compute Project um, has been growing over the last couple of years. And, you know, I, you might be, if you kind of tuned into this in 2010 or 11 or 12 or 13, and then you thought, well, yeah, that kind of faded. Um, it actually has been kind of quietly building steam. Um, and um, it, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, it's, it, that is where the hyperscalers are really collaborating. And if you want to know like what's happening inside the hyperscalers, the Open Compute Project is the place to check it out. They're remarkably uh, candid and transparent about the kinds of things they're building, which is great. Actually, OCP Summit, is, assuming that the coronavirus doesn't cancel it, which is like I'm a little worried, um, but the OCP Summit is coming up next week here in San Jose. Um, and that's a conference that I, I would really recommend attending if this is something that, that is of interest to you because um, th there's, there's a lot that's going on in OCP that's interesting. So a bunch of hardware developments that make this easier. Um, these are components. The, 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 these are a long, long, long way from an assembled system, but they are things that didn't exist even five years ago. So even five years ago, this would have been much harder. Ten years ago, much, much harder. So um, th there is reason for optimism from the hardware perspective. And then we get to the system software perspective. Um, so th th even in system software, things have changed a lot. Um, and they've changed at a couple different parts of the stack. First of all, because open source it has now become the expectation for infrastructure software, um, to the point that it's kind of created its own problems, there's now a whole ecosystem of startups that are open source companies trying to figure out how to actually sell a product to somebody and they're kind of going through um, you know, their own kind of midlife crisis as they try to figure out uh, how one actually monetizes open source, which is its own problem. But an artifact of that is that we've got a lot of software that is open source. And there, I mean, it's very easy to kind of complain about things that don't work, but there's actually a lot of stuff that's been open source that does work, um, that actually is production grade, that actually is running at data center scale. Um, and we see that, I mean, I would look at like just the databases. If you look at, at open source databases now versus open source databases a decade ago, or open source consensus systems now versus a decade ago, there is absolutely no comparison. A decade ago, you were running Zookeeper for consensus, um, and that was it. And Zookeeper is not fun. 
Um, even if you love Zookeeper, you will acknowledge that it is not fun. Apache Zookeeper is very complicated software to get working. There are now lots and lots of consensus-based systems that are out there that are open source. Data for databases. There are lots and lots of open source database systems that, that one can go build a system on. And, and that even in the last couple of years, that those have been developed. So that, that's all that much more stuff kind of in the, in the toolbox. The open operating systems are clearly all open source. I mean, there, there are effectively no proprietary operating systems left. Um, and virtually no proprietary databases left. Um, hopefully we will get vanquished the last of the proprietary databases in my lifetime. Um, but the, so I think the, the biggest surprise and the thing that if you were to kind of, if I were to go back to, you know, go back a decade to, to myself in a time machine and I were to tell my decade ago self, there'll be, there'll be open source databases. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and there'll be, there'll be open source uh, consensus-based systems. Okay, that makes sense. There will also be a very important development in programming languages. I think my past self would have decked my future self. I think my, my past self would have tried to take a swing at my, my future self because I'm a systems person. I, do, I view programming language, have viewed programming languages as, um, as a part of getting a job done, uh, very pragmatically. Um, and yes, I went through a, you know, a youthful phase of operator overloading and so on, but you, you grow out of that. Like you, 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 and if you're, you know, youth among you who are in that phase, don't worry, it'll pass. You'll grow out of it. Um, because you'll realize that some of the neat things you should do, you can do in languages doesn't mean you should do them, certainly not in deployed systems. And especially debugging the code of others, um, will help a great deal in this regard. If you're wondering how I can actually help, uh, accelerate this process, go debug the code of others. Um, and you know, I talked about DOS robbing me of my childhood. I think I would, I would say C++ robbed me of my young adulthood um, for, for much the same reasons. Um, and I, I had my love affair with C++ and then vowed to never go back to it. So for me, uh, and things like Go are interesting and Java is fine, but um, I don't want garbage collection anywhere near the systems that I'm developing. Uh, and it's, it, th that's not pejorative. I mean, garbage collection is important and I, it, it's important for, for maybe even most of the world's software. But for the software that, that I write, I need too much determinism to allow for a whistle to be blown that I can't see or hear, my software to be stopped, and for something to go scurrying around doing something that I can't see with, that I have no control over. That's what garbage collection effectively is. And garbage collection, the, the real problem with garbage collection, and I don't want to bag too much of garbage collection, but the problem with garbage collection is it becomes most problematic not on sunny days, but on stormy ones. Um, so the, when garbage collection is a problem, it's because your actual legitimate heap has grown large because you are under a high, you have a high degree of work. You have a surging amount of work. Well, garbage collection now is especially if, I mean, God forbid you have no garbage. God forbid that the heap that you have is actually been as part of a very carefully manicured program whereby when you, when you are using memory, you are actually using it because then your garbage collector is actually a heap scanner. Um, and it is a periodic heap scanner up over which you have no control. Um, that's a huge problem. And I just long since decided that it's like garbage collection, like free to be you and me, it's just not for me. Um, and it's not going to be for the systems that I develop. And indeed, I had resigned myself that like it's going to be basically C for the rest of my life. And that's fine. I, you know, I, I, I'm a craftsperson and um, th there, are, um, there are things about C that I really love. I love the fact that you are, uh, in particular, when you write C, you can feel the assembly underneath you. C is, you know, it is said of C pejoratively that it, it is portable, a portable assembly. But to me, that was never pejorative. That, that to me as a systems programmer, it's like, no, that's what I want. I want portable assembly effectively because I want to be able to control the machine. So it was a little bit surprising to me that there has been a revolution in programming languages that is really very much changing the way I and a lot of people think, and that's Rust. So if you, if you haven't played with Rust um, or haven't developed in it, you, you, you need to because um, I b fervently believe that Rust is every bit as important a uh, revolution as C. I mean, if you look at C and you look at the systems that came before it, they, they look antediluvian. Um, they, they look prehistoric and then C comes along and suddenly it feels modern. Um, but it, and if, if C is portable assembly, the problem with C is that, uh, it's, and it's not even that you, it, because I, I think people make a big deal about the fact that C is unsafe, which is definitely true. And C is definitely playing with loaded weapons all the time. That's definitely true. 
the real problem with that, it's as always, as with life, it's like, it's not you, it's always the other person that's the problem. And with C, it's not the code that you write, it's the library that you want to go link to. C composes very, very poorly, even in a world where everyone understands how to write correct C, which by the way, I have very reluctantly now realized after having done a lot of Rust or done, done a decent amount of Rust, done enough Rust anyway, um, the idea of correct C itself has so many asterisks on it because there is so much undefined behavior in C. Um, I, you know, this was hit home for me when I, I, I had a, a, a body of software that um, I uh, wrote in the early 2000s that, that became pretty ubiquitous um, or ran a, a lot of machines called D-Trace, allows you to dynamically instrument the system. There have been, um, uh, uh, there have been very few problems with D-Trace, um, but there have been two vulnerabilities in D-Trace um, over the, in the decade and a half since I wrote it. Um, the, or two vulnerabilities from me personally. I think there's been a third, but I think that was Adam, one of, my, one of the people I wrote it with. Um, but the, the two vulnerabilities that I introduced were both due to effectively malicious integer overflow, where I was doing, a, I was comparing a bounds incorrectly, which is very easy to do in C. You're, you, are, you are doing a bounds check that is correct from the perspective of like this, this software works, but it won't work with malicious input. And with malicious input, it can be used to read arbitrary memory. And, with our, and, and you begin to string that together with other things, and suddenly you have um, a, an escalation. Um, and you're able to escalate privilege. So that was a real wake up to me. Um, Rust is not just memory safe, it is integer safe. So there are, Rust is very, uh, it is, there, there are a bunch of things interesting about Rust. Um, one is that it gives you the, 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 the power of that composability because of the contracts that it puts around memory. So Rust has a system that's called ownership and Rust, the compiler, keeps track of who owns what. And what that actually means is that it can statically make determinations about whether things can be done or not. And what, what that means is that when it's made that determination statically, it knows that this is safe. It can now generate a binary that doesn't need garbage collection. That is actually very, very fast. And so the thing that, the, the, you know, when the, the kind of the, the really the light went on with me with respect to Rust is uh, playing around with it for a small system. And uh, I, as one does, if you, again, if you haven't waded into Rust, um, you definitely want to sit down and learn it. If you try to dabble with it, it will punish you um, because the, the, the model is different. Um, but if you're a C programmer like I am, um, it, it, there is a level at which it feels intuitive. You, with C, you can feel the underlying assembly. With Rust, you can feel the underlying C. You understand why the compiler is complaining when. If you don't understand memory, you'll be very disoriented by Rust because it will be complaining and the tears will just be streaming down your cheeks. This is, tears are often streaming down your cheeks no matter what um, because the, there are times when Rust can be very up in your grill about things that can be very legitimate issues that are very frustrating. Rust kind of shifts that cognitive load to when you're actually developing the software. Um, but the thing that was interesting to me is I finally kind of, I, I went through all the phases of grief with Rust, was finally bargaining with it, and I just wanted to get this thing to compile, and I didn't care how I did it. Um, and I'm like, I just need to do this. I, I was trying to do it a clever way. I decided that I was nowhere near clever enough to do something clever in Rust, and I actually need to do it the dumbest way possible um, just to get this thing to compile, which I did. And I'm like, okay, fine. Now it works. Now I'm, I'm hoping that this thing is within 20% of my C. I'd written this thing in C and kind of rewritten it in Rust. Um, and I ran it, and it was like 35% faster than my C. It's like, now I, and I got to tell you, like, actually, it was like not good news, I felt. Like, I took pride in that C. Like, that was well-written C, okay? So, like, it was not, so, like, no, no, you're not supposed to be performed that well. It's kind of like when you get beat by your kids and some, you know, you know, your kids beat you in basketball or whatever. It's like, look, kid, you're not supposed to... You're supposed to let dad dunk on you. Um, it's, I mean, you're proud, but also like angry. Um, and so it was great that the Rust was outperforming the C, but I was also a little bit upset. I took it apart. Why was it outperforming it? And when looking at the memory behavior, it was much, much better. And I was talking to Steve Klabnik, who's in, in Rust, and I'm like, Steve, you know, it's amazing. The, the, the optimizations that you've pulled in, clearly the compiler knows so much about heaven and earth that it is able to truly solve the memory disambiguation problem. Because this, And Steve's like, no, it's, it's true that that's all possible. We haven't done any of that yet. I'm like, oh, then wait a minute, what? So actually... The Rust compiler was not being exceedingly clever. 
what was happening is that it's Rust itself that's clever because I was using the only data structure that there is no balanced binary tree data structure to use in Rust. You always use a B tree because that's the data structure that you use. Well, a B tree, as it turns out, is actually a better data structure than a balanced binary tree. A B tree is also gnarly to implement, and a, a B tree in C is really gnarly to implement, and a B tree is to implement a B tree as a library is extraordinarily gnarly because a B tree is going to be relocating things frequently as it, as it rebalances the tree. You're actually going to, you're going to transplant things, unlike with a balanced binary tree where you're just going to move pointers around. You're not going to just move pointers around. You're actually going to transit things. And the second you do that, you need to have a real contract with whomever is using that library about who's going to do what when. To the point where it's like, you really, there are not really good B tree libraries in C. I mean, like, take me up on this challenge. Go look for a good B tree library in C. It is really, really, really hard to implement because the, it, the unsafety of C makes it hard to express that contract with the library user. Hard to the point of being damn near impossible. With Rust, this is actually really easy because Rust knows who owns what when. And you are able, you are forced to use very efficient data structures. And by being forced to use efficient data structures, you have these artifacts that are high performing. Okay, so it's high performing, but okay, where can you actually use Rust? The thing that is super interesting about Rust, at least to me, and this is a new in the last year and a half, is Rust's ability to get small. So um, you can actually, you know, on these RISC-V cores on an FPGA, you know, you might have, we've got 512K of memory. Um, you know, and I was actually with another engineer of ours who's done a lot of embedded Rust work. And, um, you know, I was joking about the famous thing that Bill Gates actually never said, but is, is subscribed to him of 640K ought to be enough for everybody. Um, and we kind of joke about that because obviously 640K is, is not enough for anything. It's like, well, actually, no, 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 that's not true. 640K is actually a lot of memory. It actually is. And you actually can do a lot with 640K, especially if you are careful about the way you spend it. And Rust allows you to slim things way, way down, be borderline beyond what you can do with C. With C, you can get things very slim. Um, with, uh, with Rust, you can get things really as slim. It's really remarkable, but you still have these very rich abstractions. So really interesting development. And I, interesting development in programming languages for those of us that are actually building systems. Um, and um, it, it's the, the name of the company indeed is a, is a tip of a hat to Rust because we, we see a lot of promise in Rust. And that there are some really interesting Rust-based systems like Talk. Uh, Talk is a Rust-based operating system actually originally developed here at Stanford by Phil Levis and um, Amit Levy and co. Um, that are, are really interesting, that, that we're really fascinated by. So you kind of add all this up and there's a possibility. Um, we think that, that you, this is something that actually can be built. Um, so this is what we've done. We have um, in, uh, we started the Oxide Computer Company. Uh, we um, raised um, seed capital at the end of 2019. Um, if, you're, if you want my, happy to give my war stories on what it's like to raise a hard tech seed um, these days, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, it's it's not even a hot and cold experience. Um, it is uh, both very, very frustrating and very energizing because when you find the right folks, it can be very energizing, but you find a lot of the not right folks, that's that's not less energizing. Um, but we're able to to um, raise enough money to really give ourselves a shot. Um, that, that financing closed at the end of 2019, um, and we're ramping the team now. I think we've got 15 folks now um, going for a fully functional prototype in 2021 and systems themselves in 2022. Um, and we're, I mean, obligatory. Um, if, you're, if this is something that interests you, uh, we're definitely, check us out, we're definitely out there. Um, and we've got a long way to go. I mean, I wanna accurately represent where we are. We really have just gotten started on this path. Um, and we are, um, it is really only in the last, honestly, couple of weeks that in the last, you know, eight weeks or so. Um, but even then, we have already seen that there is a lot of promising direction to be had. So this is a very ambitious problem. It's very hard. Um, there are lots of companies that have tried this and uh, have not succeeded. Um, I'm happy to go through those at length if you're curious because I feel like I've collected all of those. Um, the, uh, maybe even to a fault, actually. <laughs> um, when we were doing our raise, um, we, I really wanted to learn from every single person's experience. Um, and as a result, I had an appendix slide on 
every single company you could possibly name that looked anything like a computer company in the last 15 years. Um, and, the, and the slides were, we, we'd talk about, you know, the company and what happened and so on. And, uh, and then we would be able to go straight to those appendix slides. So if someone named a company, we could immediately go to the slide and pull it up. And it, I, I think it may have counted against us in a couple of, because we were then kind of viscerally reminding people of all these like dead companies. It's probably like not a good idea to parade a bunch of dead companies in front of an investor who was like, what? All you think about is like dead companies. It's like, well, no, it's important to learn from all these. It's like, is this a good idea to invest in or not? Um, so may, we may have overshot the mark on that. Uh, in particular, there was a moment where an investor mentioned eGenera, which is great because it was the first person to mention eGenera, and I had an eGenera slide that I spent a long time preparing. So I'm like, okay, uh, Jess, go to slide, you know, 102. She pulls up the eGenera slide, and the investor's like, oh, wow, interesting. Wow, God, they raised a lot of money. Oh, wow. Oh, God, and that was a zero. Oh, and I'm like, no, no, they're still alive. And, they're, and I'm like, wait a minute, why are we talking? We shouldn't be talking about companies that have raised. All right, so anyway, um, we probably overshot the mark on that. But um, nonetheless, we prevailed, we raised, um, and, we're, and we're going. Um, so very exciting. Um, the other thing, the thing I would kind of close on, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open up for questions, and I'm happy to kind of go in arbitrary directions for folks. But um, one of the things that that we wanted to do as part of starting a company, um, I felt we feel my co my co founders Steve Talk and Jess Brazell, we've spent our careers at the hardware software interface, and I feel that to that that, that some of that um, lore is being lost, if you will. So uh, we wanted to start what we felt was a kind of a missing conversation um, and started a podcast on the metal um, where we have uh, had conversations with folks at the hardware software interface and actually just had a recording today that I'm very excited to get out there. It was really a, a, a terrific recording uh, with Star Simpson, if you know her, really amazing. But we have had um, a bunch of really interesting conversations um, and um, with stories from, uh, from across the spectrum, from across the ages to, to just recent, um, across kind of all ages and, 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 dis and dispositions and so on. But definitely check that one out. So check out On the Metal is, is that podcast. And with that, I will gladly take any questions. Yes. Yep. By HP. Yeah. This is the second time that Convex has come up in conversation this week, actually. So they drew the dead computer companies into the concrete. Oh my goodness. So for those of you who are online or can't necessarily hear the uh, talking about Convex Computer Company, uh, based in Dallas, I think. Uh, um, and uh, they had a, apparently a cemetery for... Oh, I, I, well, so competition is one thing. I, yeah, I mean, you can definitely do the competition thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's more interesting, I think, to keep track of, of your ancestors than your competition. Um, because I think they've got more to teach you than, than your, than, I mean, it's easy to kind of disparage your competition. I mean, everyone likes to do that, but the, uh, it, it's the folks that seemed like they were in the right place at the right time and, and with the right technology and didn't succeed that are, are in some ways more intriguing. Well, what is, happened was at Asplot in 1990, we held a dead computer architect meeting <laughs> and actually for a friend of mine at IBM, 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 In 1990, yeah. Right. We went to a couple logic too too soon, probably. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, and that's a very different era too, right? I mean, you're looking at a very very different era, um, where you are. I mean, some of those are, are microprocessor based companies. Some of them aren't. Um, you're discrete logic. I mean, you've got a whole bunch of other things in the mix. Um, yeah. Multi. I do not have a slide on multi flow or convex. 
So, uh, yeah, that's a great question. The, 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 the target market is those folks that are running compute on-premises. Um, so they are uh, – and, and they kind of come into a couple different flavors. They are the folks that are running on-premises on for good reasons, which there are, there are actually good reasons to run on-premises. Um, and these folks have been told that basically there are no good reasons and everything should be in the cloud. Um, and if you, and you might be one of these, but if, it, if you talk to these customers, they tend to be pretty animated because they're being told they don't exist um, or to the degree they exist, it's like they exist because they're dummies who don't understand the cloud. It's like, no, no, I understand the cloud. I'm not a dummy. I've been on the cloud. I understand all that. I've got a regulatory issue or I've got an AWS bill that will capsize the company. I've got a, the cogs of cloud. And if you talk to, and there are lots of different people in lots of different domains. And the thing that we see, and we lived this so we, we know that this is coming, is that the cloud's expensive. I mean, the cloud is, it's very artfully priced in that it goes from free, effectively, like I don't care, I've got cloud credits, or like I don't even know what the cloud bill is, I don't even, I, I just don't care, to, oh my God, this is crushing me, seemingly overnight. Like, the, 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 there's seemingly no time where it's like, oh, wow, okay, I'm kind of groaning, but all right. It's just like instantly you go from, and, and by the time you really figure out we are being debilitated by elastic compute prices, it's very hard to do something about it or can be hard to do something about it. Now, there, and there have been a lot of companies that have been vacillating in, in part because it is so hard right now to go on-prem there are companies that are like God, we're like we're being killed, but we 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 want to go on prem, but we don't have the expertise, or this is just too much of a mess, or we've tried we or what we see increasingly is we we stood up some racks and it was a disaster, um, and for all the reasons that that, that we understand. So the, we know that that market exists, um, and we in part because uh, like not only are they exist, but like they're ornery. Um, I mean they've been like. You know, not only are they not have a roof on their head, but it's been like raining recently, like a cold rain, and they're they're, they're pissed. Um, and actually, it was, it was funny when we were talking because, so, as you can imagine, part of raising around, you know, investors want to like talk to prospective customers. And we got to the point where we had customers, who, and we were very worried about being very mindful of those folks, and and God bless them, and you know who you are out there, um, who are. Uh, who are so excited about this, they've been willing to go through this journey with us, and in particular, have been willing to talk to investors. Um, but we were like, oh gosh, you know, I hope we're being like respectful of your time. You're like, no, 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 like, I, like, bring the VCs to me. Like, I want to explain to them that I exist. And so we'd have VCs who have been talking to our customers, they almost were like shell shocked. They'd come back to the customer, be like, okay, wow, you're like, you're like, you, you got some customers that are spun up. It's like, yeah, no, they're angry. Like, I hope you didn't tell them they don't exist because they get very, very upset if you tell them that they don't exist. Um, so we know that the market is out there. We know it very much exists. And we think it is today, it's those folks that have been uh, left for dead on-prem. But tomorrow um, and in the coming decades, we believe it will be those folks that are born on the cloud and move on-prem, primarily for economic reasons. Yes? Yeah, so, um, and Intel, actually, I, I, Intel is actually fine. I, I actually don't have a problem with Intel. I, the Intel, uh, Intel's only, um, I, the only thing, I, I wish Intel had decided to become a computer company a long time ago instead of just being a microprocessor company, but it didn't want to compete with its own channel. Uh, Microsoft, I don't use any Microsoft products and haven't for, ever since Bill Gates robbed me in my childhood, I've not used Microsoft products. So Microsoft is kind of a non-factor here. Um, but for, in terms of microprocessors, it's a very good question. The question is, um, what about ARM? What about RISC-V? Uh, Risk Five is 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 great. Risk Five is nowhere near ready to run uh, modern heavy duty workloads. I mean, what what Risk Five is perfect for is these kind of embedded use cases. It's great, and where you need that kind of that soft core, or even a hard core, where you want to really reason about it, but you don't need an actually high performing core at the at the, the boundary of process. So if you need a seven nanometer, like, I don't think you can get a seven nanometer, I don't think anyone makes a seven nanometer risk five core. But if you um, if you need to be, if you want maximal density, maximal performance, right now it needs to be, right now it's AMD or Intel or or ARM. Um, and like the Graviton 2 is really interesting from AWS on the Ares core. Um, ARM is, I, I, I honor ARM. Um, 
I, ARM feels very lateral from x86, um, it, especially AMD right now is, I, I mean, I, I don't know that I buy a performance argument um, and I don't know really buy a power argument. I don't really know what problem I would be solving with ARM, but that's not, I mean, n nothing against ARM. Um, and personally, maybe I'm just a victim of, of the last wars. I fought the ISA war before and I really don't want to fight it again. Um, I have long since accepted that it's going to be x86 from an ISA perspective, at least for these kind of virtualized workloads. So for us, it's x86, um, but everything else we basically put on the table. Yes. Yeah, so the question is how, you, how do you evaluate whether you want to be on, on kind of one or the other on-prem or on the cloud? Um, you, you'll, you know. Um, if you're in the, this economic use case, you definitely know. And you should be, everyone should be on the cloud. Cloud's great. In fact, we talked to some people like, oh, I love the fact that you're like an anti-cloud play. We're like, no, 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 not anti-cloud. Not anti-cloud at all. Very pro-cloud. Elastic compute makes a lot of sense for most things. Anyone starting anything should always start on the cloud. That said, you should start on the cloud knowing that depending on what you're doing, you may get to a scale where you do need to evaluate going on-prem. Um, and generally, you know, generally it's when you're getting ready to file your S1 <laughs> and you are going from a, you know, you are a growth funded SaaS company uh, and now you actually want to become a public company and now actually you're, you care about margin. And when you start to view the cloud as COGS, now it's probably time to start thinking about being on your own physical machine at the scale we're talking about. There are other reasons to be on your own device for kind of, you know, personal, more personal reasons. But at the scale we're talking about, it's, the, it's a scale problem. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the question is like, does Rust get you the ability to get close to the hardware? Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, actually in a way that is, way more coherent than with C. Because with C, actually, it is really tricky to mix C and assembly in, in like, you've got a C program, like an operating system has a bunch of components that are in assembly. Um, and intermixing that with C, um, you're kind of in like, the compiler's in like best of luck land, and it, it kind of like, can do arbitrary things. It's very hard to kind of intermix those things. And with Rust too, I mean, you're, with Rust, you're also still a little bit in best of luck land, but it is easier to actually co-mingle, I have found, um, assembly with, uh, with a higher level language in Rust, ironically. Um, but Rust has got all sorts of support that actually makes it easier. So you've got ways of, so I mean, as you know, kind of a silly example, but one of the things that's important is um, you have got the ability to indicate that a function should have no preamble. So it should have basically like, I want to be out of ABI land in this function. It's like, why would you want to do that? It's like, well, trust me, <laughs> I, I, not lightly, right? It's not something you do. You, it's something you do because you, you have to do it for a, so for a body of software that may be very constrained about how it operates to the point that I can't even save a stack point or I can't even do whatever my ABI preamble is. I can't safely do that in this context. And there's a, a way to indicate that in Rust, that like this, is, this should be a, a effectively a naked function. And so there are lots of things like that. Um, and with the rise of, of Rust in embedded software, where I think, I think Rust, just I think RISC-V will take over the earth first with the embedded software. I think you can make a case for Rust taking over embedded software almost first, which is kind of crazy because it's like it's got a lot of energy and momentum at other parts of the stack, but it is so far and away better than C for that embedded use case. And embedded software has historically been really, really hard to write and get right. Um, that I think that it's, it's, it's uh, and actually I would really recommend, there's a, a series of blog entries, um, Learning Rust the Dangerous Way um, by a uh, guy named Cliff Biffle, who actually now works at Oxide. Um, but um, Cliff has a, a really great writing on uh, using Rust in these embedded contexts. And you can see the tricks that he pulls and it, with the tricks that he's able to pull um, to make high performing Rust and Rust that's on the metal. It's really interesting stuff. Yes. The C integer overflow. Oh, it, it, that if you, uh, you just need to make sure that you're writing your bounds check in a way that it doesn't actually overflow. So you, you need to, you just have to be very careful when you're doing unsigned arithmetic in C in terms of the way you actually structure the expression and lint won't help you out at all. Um, and the, whereas in Rust, you will actually be told like, you can't do this, like this overflows. 
That's right. That's right. Um, sure, at some level, bad coding, I guess, but it's like the, it, uh, it's uh, something that is really, really, really hard to get right that the existing tooling does not help you get right. Like, again, like, to me, like, Lint, where are you? Like, if, if Lint does not warn you about it, I mean, certain degree, it's like, okay, like, this is my fault, but, like, hey, Lint, like, this is the reason we run Lint, to, um, And the reality is it's really, really hard for Lint to pro – Lint would, would generate too many false positives, which is the reason that Lint doesn't warn you about that condition. Um, and it, people would never use Lint because it would never shut up. Um, whereas Rust is much more constrained about, about um, the way you're able to use. Rust is not going to allow you tra to transparently mix signed and unsigned types and so on. Yes? Yeah. Not the application. No, no, no. But, but the... Where does what come from? The oh, in terms of the apps that that well, I mean, th those come from whomever. You, th I mean, there are lots of applications in the universe, obviously. But if you know, if you got like a just a uh, you know an example of a customer that is uh, prominently going back on premise Uber, they've they've talked about this publicly, where uh, Uber is is now running on on premises, um, and so they've got a bunch of software that they've written. It, they, they own the software. That's the privacy. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Not running Oracle or any of my way. Not running Oracle. No. No. You mentioned one other yeah. thing that's new to me. What is the MDB training? Um, so... <laughs> yeah, so this is where... Uh, so um, it is very uh, complicated to make high speed interfaces. I mean, this is not my domain of expertise, so let's just like, let's just do the big kind of like caution here. Um, but it is um, because you can go, it's a pico inch, right? You can go an inch and a picosecond, and the different traces that you take will have, take different lengths of time. And at the speeds at which DDR4, DDR3, DDR, and coming to DDR5 all operate, all of those different trace lengths have totally different manifestations in terms of, so you have to have effectively different timing depending on your trace and dim training, and then environmental conditions, a bunch of other things. And dim training is effectively the memory controller figuring out how to tune itself to get from a CPU to memory. Actually, I think it's more like 100, no, 100 nanometers per picometer, pico. Yeah, whatever. whatever, it, it, it is, it, 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 these interfaces are very fast, um, and it's um, so dim training. It, right. Um, well, in a vacuum, right? So the, in in copper, everything's a lot slower. But um, anyway, so the, 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 the dim training is about figuring out uh, and about um, and w when you reseed a dim, for example, it will retrain, um, and that takes time. It takes time to actually figure out what those kind of constants are, and that's very proprietary kind of stuff. Uh, I, longer than that, and this, yeah, this is it, you're I, out of my domain of expertise. Um, but it, it is long enough that it's not something you want to do when you, if you if you can avoid it. Yes. Um, so, it, it, I mean, it will know, the, 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 the actual, the memory controller will know what DIM is in that slot. So it, it knows something about that DIM. And if you cha change a DIM, if you were to reseed it, um, well, yeah, if you were to reseed it when the, when the power was off, I guess it wouldn't necessarily know. Um, but there are certainly ways to get the, the, the DIM to, to retrain. If you, were to, if you were to change the slot, for example, the DIM, DIM would retrain. Um, but this is honestly, it's an area of the system we've not historically had a lot of visibility. Yes? Mm -hmm. The EC2, so if you, if you base everything on, on, on EC2, then you've got, when you go, so when you go on prem, it's open source EC2, and that's easy, but there's all these... Well, it's not easy, but yes. <laughs> compared to all the applications management and all that other stuff, which as far as I know, there aren't... 
Yeah, that's true. And, and so the question is like, well, what about all these other services? And there are a bunch of services. Um, and there was a time when people believed they were going to consume any service that any cloud provider put in front of them. Right, but if you right, so there, and I mean, you can view part of the energy of Kubernetes is about taking that control back from the cloud providers. So people actually don't want to have to have a dependency on Redshift or what have you, right? They they actually are so, you know, they're. Um. Yeah. That, yes. That, that that's true to a degree. That's actually less true than it was five years ago. In my in my view. Um, in my view, people are really trying to pare down their dependencies to EC2, EBS, S3, and their logical equivalent in other clouds. Um, with the idea being, like, if you give me a, if you if you give me those services, I can hydrate things up the stack. But I don't want to actually build something out that's dependent upon RDS or dependent upon, you know, SQS or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are like Amazon's got their F one thing, right? That is, you can um, so th they those do exist. Um, I, um, I, I we don't use them because we're actually just doing an FPGA like the old school way um, with, with like a programmer and an FPGA that's sitting in front of you. But th those things do exist, and they they can be useful for certain applications. Is my understanding? Yeah. Uh, well, we're not depending on really anybody to deliver here uh, in terms of these trends. So the uh, these are things that are, are already out there. So like we're definitely, I mean, it's it's easy. Yeah, they're, they're, like Rust is definitely production grade and 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 is is usable. A lot of the software is is, is either production grade or usable or something that we will extend. Um, at, you know, things like BlueSpec are open source and Chisel and Spinal HDL are out there. Um, the, uh, Risk Five is definitely out there. You can build on Risk Five today. So the the, the um, and I mean, a certain other of these trends that we are encouraging, obviously, we want to see um, and want to collaborate with others. But I would say there's, um, these are things that are all happening kind of independent of what we're doing, but things that we are certainly a part of and, and harnessing. I understand, but there is enough of it out there so you can use it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much.